working. Um, <clears throat> what happened? Settings fine. Hey, no, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay, the director is uh, getting the getting the frame ready. Okay, uh, I just want to read from uh, Proverbs twenty five and verse twenty eight. Okay, Proverbs twenty five and twenty eight. It says, "Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls." Right? It's like uh, if uh, I'm not self controlled, you know, that's the thing. If I don't have control over myself, um, if I can't rule over my own spirit. I'm like a city broken down without walls. So city broken down without walls, you know, in the time of uh, it, the writing of these uh, the scriptures, the city, um, the wall of the city is like the protection of the city. The wall of the city is like the boundary, the protection from all outside uh, forces, enemies. So um, without wall, that's why, you know, Nehemiah, Nehemiah is so moved that uh, the walls of Jerusalem have fallen down because it's it's open to any kind of attack open to anybody walking in any it's most vulnerable right so just think about it like uh, if we are not able to rule over our own spirit um, maybe it, it, in terms of uh, in terms of anger in terms of i don't know mood swing uh, whatever it is you know if there is no temperance or self discipline we are vulnerable actually like for example if a person is very angry he or she might think hey i'm actually in control you know i'm able to direct my anger and get things done but actually it's a place of vulnerability right because it's a place where you can get, easily get triggered and go off focus you know easily get triggered and uh, lose control over one oneself and that invites all kinds of uh, problems into our lives right so that is what it says so the good thing is this you know what we see in galatians 5 and 22 23 galatians 5 22 23 the fruit of the spirit but the fruit of the spirit talk uh, the verses before that list a lot of the things of the flesh um, and then it says but the fruit of the spirit and one by one uh, and in verse 23 what is listed is self control the fruit of the spirit is self governing ability right so the the holy spirit really works in us in cooperation with us and uh, builds this quality uh, called self-control right so there is a you know slow transformation or fast transformation it depends on how we how much we uh, you know how much we cooperate and uh, surrender to the work of the spirit right so self-control is a fruit of the holy spirit the work of the holy spirit in our lives right so um, so praise god for that right god is with us he's working in us so that we can be like a city with walls so that, so that we can be protected you know this this quality of self control that the holy spirit brings in is for our good right it's for our protection so that we will not be like a city without walls that we will not be open to the attack of the enemy um, that we will not lose uh, ourselves in you know various things but we will be protected right okay so let's let's just pray and um, invite the work of the holy spirit and say lord more of you Right, more of you. I just want my life to be built up. I want this self-governing ability to be made even more evident and strong in my life. And um, I just want to pray that I will be protected and strong. Right, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the work of your Spirit in our spirit, Lord. And Father, we thank you. The fruit of your Spirit is self-control, Lord. We thank you for this self-governing ability that uh, you bring into our lives, Master. Father, we thank you that, and we invite you, Lord, invite you, invite more of you into our lives, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that even as we open ourselves, open our hearts to the work of the Spirit, Lord, we pray that you would have your way, Lord. Let the fruit of the Spirit be shown visible in our lives, Master God, in everyday practical life, in, in our interactions, Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit be built up, and so that we will be like a city with walls, that we will be like a city well protected, that we will be a strong people, Father God, and um, Lord, um, displaying, oh Father God, your virtues, oh God, displaying your glory, Master. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you, Father God. We commit this day into your mighty hands, this time into your mighty hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Okay, so um, yeah, online students also, um, you can go to that link and start filling out uh, your sermon topic and title. Uh, I see Jackin um, filled out. Yeah, by the time, uh, yeah, by the way, uh, when you write your names, write the full name, right? Your first name, second name, as you've given in the Bible College. So that will help. Okay, so today um, let's look at. Um, So we were looking at leading people to respond, right? And uh, how we how we can lead people to respond. So, so this is in response to the message, response to the message that you've shared. Now, uh, what are the ways by which um, we can lead people to respond? So, what are what are some ways that you have you have observed, you know, leading people to respond to the message that was shared? Anything? Yeah. Uh, sorry, what? To be interactive, huh? okay. So maybe it's a small gathering, so you can ask questions. You can open up the time to uh, ask questions. Yeah, um, but this this is actually slightly different in the sense um, asking questions is more of a, a further aiding the understanding, like whatever you've shared. Okay, there are some questions, there are some doubts, clarifications, and it's a it's a so. so yeah, so the so the response is like, how do you want people to respond to the message that you shared? Like, you shared some message, and it could be on various things. It could be on whatever you know, you the topic that you shared. So, how what do you want people to do? What action do you want people to take, right, in response to the message? So that's the thing, right? So, for example, if it is uh, if it's a matter of let's say the gospel being shared, uh, then the res the the you know inviting people to uh, to respond to that gospel, you know, to invite Jesus into their hearts. Like if they've never done that, to do that, right? So what are various ways by which we can do that? Right? I'm sure you would have seen uh, different ways. Leading, sorry? Yeah, you've seen. So maybe asking people to pray along, right? I've also seen where, uh, well, some places say, they say, okay, you come forward with the person who has invited you to church. Okay, you, you come with them. So they they also feel, they don't feel too out of place. I'm going with the person who, with whom I came, who invited me. So that person is also there. So then they invite them. Uh, they invite them forward if they want to respond. You know, if they want to accept, if they want to receive Jesus in their hearts. They invited forward, then they prayed for, and then they led in the prayer and, you know, uh, that happens. So... Of course, most common being lift your hands, every eye closed, every head bowed. Okay, I don't want anybody to open their eyes. Only those who are <laughs> receive Jesus, you raise your hands. And uh, invariably, there'll be some people seeing, you know, who is it? How many are there? And the pastor goes, okay, I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand, sister. <laughs> Put your hand down. And, you know, we've seen all that. But I mean, these are effective ways, right? People respond, and um, it's good. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, like people like getting people to stand up, come forward. Like, this is all you know for the like in response to the salvation message. If it's something else, right? If it's a recommitment, it is a, if it's going to be a surrender. So in line with that, you know, you can just invite people to open their hearts to the work of the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts. You know, uh, and maybe it is a it is a need, right? Maybe the message was on a breakthrough. Maybe there's a breakthrough in various aspects of their lives, you know, invite. Right? Or maybe there's something that they need to do in terms of forgiving someone, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, letting go of bitterness or unforgiveness in their lives. Um, invite the Holy Spirit to work on them, right? Invite the Holy Spirit to bring healing to their hearts and, and then, you know, move. So these are different ways we get to... Uh, you know, get people to respond to the message. Okay, um, and it is a powerful time, right? It's uh, it's good if we you know, uh, give this time. It's a powerful time where people have just heard the word, which the word of God brings faith. Right? It's the word of God which brings faith. So faith to act on the word is there already there in people's heart if they have received. And God has spoken through them, through the message, right? In various points, God has emphasized certain things. The Holy Spirit has emphasized certain things to their hearts. So now is the time to really act on it, right? Move on it. So 
um you know some of these things could be uh, like a step by step process maybe you know it's not the full breakthrough yet but it's a step in that direction right so uh, we need to be mindful of that and help people with that okay okay so any questions on this before we move um Mm -hmm. Yeah. So application, we've already uh, we've already shared the application. Okay, these are the three things that they can do. Maybe it's one of those things. You know, maybe it's uh, let's say you're you're teaching on let's say the whole whole message is on praying in tongues, for example. You know, or baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that. The application and the takeaway would be that I'd say, okay, would you like to start praying? Would you like to invite Jesus? I mean, uh, to baptize you, and would you like to take a step of faith in that direction? So, so that would be the thing, yeah. and to encourage them, okay, maybe not here, but then when you go to the privacy of your homes, you know, do the same thing. You know, invite them to do those things. So that would be it. Um, not every time. It depends on the message. So it, let's say you're teaching on end times, you know, and me, a lot of it would be information, understanding about the end times. But there could be something which would be um, an emphasis of it. Okay, maybe, you know, an expectation to live in a state of alertness, to live with expectation, um, to maybe to, you know, to not be passive, right? To do the work of the Lord, these these could be various things. Even if, if it's a message like uh, you know end times, so it's it's more of a preparing of our hearts, and maybe it's it's just the heart's response to God. We can even leave it as okay. Why don't you pray? What is the Lord Lord putting in your heart? Right? Why don't you pray? And uh, on those lines, it's as simple as that. You know, so pray, make a commitment, make a decision, whatever the Lord is prompting in your heart. So the thing is, it's it's good to do that then, rather than leaving it to you know when you go out and you know a lot of things can happen and you just leave the environment, right? So it's good to have it there and then uh, have the Lord meet with them. And, and at those times, people you know expect the presence of, I mean, experience the presence of God, experience the power of God. Uh, maybe a word of God is quickened to them, and you know all these things happen, right? So it's good to do it uh, at the end. Of the message, right? Okay. Okay. So, so in line with the, you know, the, with the message that is being shared, and also with the application, I just want to continue on. Um, like in your notes, you have that application of scripture to today's culture and people. Okay. Now, when we look at application, see the truth should. Um, uh, the, the, the interpretation of the truth should actually help us to apply the word. Okay. And it's not the other way around, where we have an application. Okay, so this is the course of action that you need to take. And based on that, we we are reinterpreting the or stretching the verse to fit that. Right. So that is what is called as you know, just forcing the scripture in order to fit this. So we need to be a little careful. Like, for example, uh, you know, certain scriptures are mentioned there. Um, like Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8. It's all about, you know, stumbling block. But that stumbling block and being a barrier, you know, uh, Romans 14 talking about, uh, I think, uh, uh, food offered to idols. Let's just go there. And maybe somebody can turn to 1 Corinthians 8. Okay. Yeah, so um, it's talking about how, um, how to receive a person who is uh, maybe not very mature in faith, not very strong in faith, and not to dispute over doubtful things. You know, maybe the person doesn't eat meat. Uh, maybe the person esteems one day, you know, more respects one day more than the other, and observes days and seasons and all that. So it's it's talking about how 
you know one should uh, you know, one, one one can actually not dispute about those things you know these are minor things but let them do it it's it's okay as they observe it's unto the lord and so on and also about food right uh, and typically it's about uh, he just says uh, verse 15 um, you know do not destroy with your food the one for whom christ died okay so um, it's it's fine you know do not destroy the work of god pursue the things which make for peace and all that so so in this he's actually referring to uh, the application is for a believer. Okay, the context is that okay, a believer who is weak in faith, a believer who is, uh, you know, who who is immature, maybe. So that is the thing. So this is not to be stretched for a non-Christian, okay, for a non-believer, right? So so that is the uh, thing, right? One other scripture. Uh, I think which is normally used 1 Corinthians 3, right? Which is about how our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if anyone uh, defiles the body, is that what is there? 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Yeah. Um, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, so... Like some people can be very insensitive and use that scripture to say, okay, this person took their own lives and therefore they are damned, you know, for for a destiny without God to be in hell. Okay. So, but is that what that verse is saying? Right? It's saying that, yes, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. If anyone defies the temple in the sense, if you uh, if you live in a manner unworthy of the temple of God, I mean, un uh, unworthy of the Spirit of God dwelling in you, if you indulge in works of the flesh, if you indulge in something else, then, you know, yes, God will bring about uh, a judgment because the temple is holy, whose temple you are. So is that referring to, you know, can we apply it to say, okay, this person took their own lives, therefore, you know, God is going to, send them to hell right uh, people use that scripture right so so these kind of things where the scripture is not the truth of god's word is not actually saying something but based on the application you are using the scripture to fit kind of give weightage to your application okay you want to say something but then you are using the scripture to say something which the scripture is actually not saying you know applying the, uh, the scripture so um, so that's the first thing. The application must not change the, bring about a change in the interpretation of the word. Right? Whatever the word is saying, that's the thing. The second one, yeah, you have a question? Oh. Okay, the second one is, see, what is the scope of the uh, application which the scripture is talking about? Okay. What is the scope of the application that uh, scripture is talking about? You know, can we use it to broader that scope? Okay, so this is what it says, and this is also what it applies for. You know, examples like that. Now, can we actually use it? Okay, um, broader than what the application is meant for. For example, one Corinthians six. Now, this is again about the body uh, being the, uh, uh, you know, the collectively. The believers being the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, right? 1 Corinthians 6, um, 19. Right? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Sorry, this is actually individually, right? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, can I use it to say you should not smoke cigarettes? What do you think? We can, we can, right? So, so the the uh, the application is actually sexual immorality. If you look at the, you know, if, if you look at it, right, so one Corinthians six, you look at verse eighteen. It says, "Flee sexual," uh, you know, right from uh, I think sixteen onwards. 
um, 15 onwards, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take a member of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not, and so on. So it's about sexual immorality. So don't use your body for immoral purposes, right? Um, and then that context is, don't know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, but can I use it for, you know, like drinking and smoking and kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So th even though the application, you know, the context is not that, but I can use it. Right. That's the, that's the thing. What about this one? Uh, which talks about uh, mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah so so I'm just thinking that you know uh, uh, the, the the place that where we can use you know use is that uh, um, that we should not let anything rule over us. In the sense, like in terms of addictions, uh, ruling over us, controlling us, and uh, the flesh ruling over us. So that would be the thing. And also, it's destruction for the body, the physical body. right? So in terms of that, yes, we can. Um, so here, the context is absolutely completely different. It's about sexual immorality. So we can. But we can say it, but it would not be 100% correct. That your body is holy, we can say, okay, you don't. God doesn't want you to, you know, destroy your body. In that case, in that sense, you can say, right? You don't. You don't want your body to be dis, uh, destroyed. You don't want your body to be, uh, you know, uh, it's for holy purpose, but you don't want it to be, you know, corrupted and destroyed and uh, suffer. You know, why should you suffer? So you can use it. Um, yeah. Right. I think uh, one one verse which we can use is Colossians three, where um, let's look at that scripture. Colossians three uh, seventeen twenty three, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God the Father through Him. So, would you be able to smoke a cigarette and say, "I'm doing it in Jesus' name"? <laughs> you know. And uh, verse 23, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. <laughs> so, you know, these scriptures really help us, you know, bring perspective into our actions, whatever we are doing, you know. Um, so that's a check for us as believers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, um, see, Second Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Okay, there's another uh, scripture. Second Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Um, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? So is this, is this a commandment, um, you know, uh, asking us to check ourselves or introspect? Um, yes, it is. Right? And then if you look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3, where Paul says, "I do not judge myself." Okay, so I don't. I, it's it's for me, for me. It's a very small thing to be judged by a human court, and he says, "You know, I do. I do not even judge myself." In the sense, you know, I know that God uh, is my judge, and uh, but uh, the uh, yeah. Let's just look at that verse. He's talking about um, you know one should be found faithful, and he's also addressing the fact that people are actually telling him. Um, or uh, uh, judging him, you know, harshly. So he's saying, for it is for me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, uh, etc. And then he says, therefore, judge nothing before it's time. Uh, right. So, so in, is that something which is contradiction to introspection and reflection? You know, the answer is no. Right. So he's talking about. Um, Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And so here, he's addressing a fact that 
a, a, a situation in the Corinthian church where people were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas or Peter, you know. So they were also saying, Paul is, um, you know, Paul is, his letters are great, but in physical appearance, he is feeble and, you know, he's not so this thing. Um, and also, uh, you know, they, they were kind of making judgment on based on their physical thing. And also, and and because of that, they were saying Apollos is greater, you know, Peter is greater, maybe Paul is not so. So they were actually judging him like that. So, so then he says collectively, you know, let a man so consider us as stewards of God. And then if you look at the scriptures before that, he's saying, you know, that God uses one to sow, God uses one to water, one to reap, but it's God who gives the increase. So we are all of God. He says we are all in God's team, right? So in line with that, he's saying, I don't judge myself, you know, I don't judge myself. So it is not something to be used against introspection, examining oneself to see if we are going in the right way, if we if to see that, okay, are we being sensitive to God? It is not a, you know, we can't use that, right? So things like that. So, yeah. Um, so we, it just goes on to say that we should be a little careful when it comes to application, interpreting scriptures, you know, don't stretch it to fit the application, right? Look at what the scripture actually is stating, look at the context, look at the background, and if it fits it, use it. Okay. Several other examples are there, so you can you know go through that. Um, okay. Another one, the third one, um, is uh, about. Um, okay, let's say tarrying in the spirit, right? What does it mean? Wait, waiting for the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So Acts chapter one. Verse four. Now, this is also something that was taught and observed by the church in the early days. Early days meaning, you know, during the times of the um, revival um, and so on. Acts chapter one, verse four. What does it say? And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Okay. So that's what the Lord Jesus tells the disciples. Then, if you go to verse thirteen, he says that they all entered. They went up. Um, they were. Uh, it talks about the upper room, and these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the men, and it, you know, and, and so they were all waiting, continuing. So, the application of this was that uh, how it was actually applied uh, to the body of Christ was that in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to wait. Okay. It's not enough for you to just pray, but you need to, the old English used was tarry in the spirit. You need to wait. The Lord will choose the time, the Lord will choose the day, but you need to continue waiting upon the Lord and then he will pour out, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, is that valid or not? Because the Lord Jesus asked them to wait and these 120, they were waiting, praying. So is it is it valid or not? If it's valid, why? If it's not valid, why? Mm. Yeah, you probably you can use the mic and okay. it's here. So if it's the first time you wait. Like there's the first time that God is like gonna pour out His Spirit, and that was after that. It is obviously gonna be a free gift to all. Just like that. Mm. This is the first time. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, it was definitely the first time uh, the Holy Spirit was being poured out, uh, and the reason why He asked them to wait was was for the Feast of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, right? It was uh, so. That was the thing. So on the day of Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So that was the timing, God's timing. But after that, when we read Philip going to Samaria, Peter and John going there, or uh, you know Peter going to Cornelius' house, uh, Paul in Damascus, all these things were 
right then and there. They were, it was not as if they were waiting for the you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here this waiting was, the tarrying was for the those 50 days after the first Feast of First Fruits on the day of Pentecost, right? So we see that. So, so the application again, of course, you know, it's good to wait on the Lord. It's good to, but then, then we don't have to say, okay, I don't know when he's going to pour out. Uh, I have to be in a constant state of waiting. And if he chooses to, he will, right? We can be in faith and we have to receive then and there, right? So, so those kind of things. Um, then one more, let's just look at one more. Yeah. Acts 2.38, yeah. Yeah. Gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so the thing is, um, so he says, uh, let each one of you be baptized in the name of the Jesus. Uh, each one of you be baptized. Repent first. Repent, and lead, which means you become born again. You come to the Lord and you be baptized. Okay, and then you will receive the, whole, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's that's the normal, you know, progression. You repent, and your baptism is a sign of repentance, and of course, you're being filled. Uh, no, he's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about baptize, being baptized in water, gift of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, not not really, because Saint Peter, when he went to Cornelius' house, people received Christ, they got filled in the Holy Spirit and prayed in tongues, and then he says, "Hey, how can I stop them from being water baptized?" And he baptizes them. Saint Peter, Acts chapter ten. No, so it's not the order; it's God can use any any other thing. So the important thing is you receive Christ and uh, baptism. Water baptism is a sign of yeah, you know, your it's a symbolic, you know, you know, it's a significant symbolic proclamation of what has happened to you. I'm dead in Christ, and I'm I'm born again. My new life, uh, my old is gone, new has come, and your and it's of course an obedience of uh, the instruction of Jesus, and so you do that. Uh, but the baptism of the Holy Sp Holy Spirit can ha happen any time, like we see. Yeah. yeah, right. So so yeah. So if you yeah, um, I hope that helps, right? So Acts chapter 4, if we go there, and then verse 32, right? So it says that, um, you know, the, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one mind. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So can we say, you know, this is how a church should be, right? My laptop is yours. <laughs> My car, you know, is yours. You know, I can't say it is mine. So it's communal living. But that's what it says. This is how it was. So how do you apply that? <laughs> oh, Francis, Francis felt like singing a song, I think. <laughs> so uh, yeah, online students also like, you know, what do you... Um, Acts 432. Sir, my dad was preaching on Sunday and he told this thing, the same verse. And then everything which uh, which is there in the church compound. So our church is in between houses. So there are so many uh, trees, mango trees, everything, leafy vegetables and all. So after dad told this thing, after the church service, everyone went in the car, the fruits, leaf, leaf vegetables and all that. And they said, Pastor only told me everything is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Pastor, yeah. According to what Pastor said, like uh, regarding this, same, like, is more complicated thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what happened is, like, not this was, like, my father only preached. So, it's a New Year sermon. So, what happened is, uh, my father preached like us love each other. This is a topic. So after service, one person went to one 
and they had okay pastor said love each other from this new year we can love each other so it became a big problem <laughs> so so radical obedience praise god for that <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah i know misapplication of the truth is uh, uh, has uh, damaging consequences yeah so with regard to this you know we know that uh acts chapter 2 people had gathered together for the feast feast of pentecost they were all there right and there was this major outpouring of the holy spirit acts chapter 2 verse 38 39 we see that how many were added um to the church yeah right so uh, does 38 talk about that no um so we see huge numbers being added and they were all you know they were all there and they did not go back you know acts chapter 3 talks about that and acts chapter 4 how they were arrested and so this is how they were at that time so they had gathered and there was this outpouring of the holy spirit there was this great huge number which had come to know christ and people were from all the surrounding area so they were there and this is how it was like when the, they were multitude was together and they were sharing everything and uh, you know there's that is, so there were, so scriptures just it, luke is just writing about an observation now you know now the multitude those who believed were of one heart one mind one soul neither did anyone say any other things and with great power the apostles gave uh, witness you know then they sold stuff they brought for the sake of ministry etc acts chapter 5 we read about ananias and sapphira and what happened you know so so the thing is this yes you know we we are called to you know share be kind uh, share to those in need and take care of others needs etc which is very very valid scripture but this thing it was an occurrence in scripture at that time in in history uh, when when people were together when they experienced the outpouring of the holy spirit right so but after that you see you know there was a persecution people went there was there was if you look at the church in antioch if you look at the church in ephesus you know all these different churches uh, we don't read about the same thing right and even like paul writes to timothy and, uh, and paul gives an instruction you know let a man work if he does not work you know he shall not eat and things like that you know not being a busy body in other people's affairs so um so he's laying down those you know the principles and so on so uh, let him who's you know who's stealing steal no more but work with his hands so that he might have something to give those who have uh, others who have need right so so that is the thing so so this whole thing of communal living and uh, you know is it uh, it is for that you know for when that outpouring happened that is the thing so so we should not misapply you know stretch out and misapply the scripture the other thing is also about the crusades right um god asked joshua to go destroy the giants take over the land this is a promised land so history you know talks about how these people waged holy wars you know in conquest of the lands right uh, like the spanish inquisition or these crusades because of which people still talk still talk about it saying you know the christians also you know you guys also did this you know you forced you know you killed you you know destroyed uh, and saying that you were spreading the gospel that was not spreading the gospel right um right from constantine's time and and others you know, who waged wars in the name of uh, jesus and uh, well they so so that is not actually a biblical precedent for us to go and wage a war in the name of christ to conquer a land in the name of christ right so things like that so we just need to be careful when we are applying uh, that when it comes to application the of the truth well we well it is good commendable that we are basing it on scripture but is the text talking about the same thing right okay yeah yeah that's what uh, we see can we actually take it um no we cannot we cannot see uh, multitude of those who believed were of one heart one soul neither did anyone say that they had possessed over them but they had all things in common and with great power 
uh, nor was there any of them who lacked. They were all possessors of lands and sold them and brought the proceeds and laid them at, and they distributed each one as everyone had need. So we see this. But we see the you know practical outworking of it much later that it did not continue like that. It was there for that time. It did not continue that way. So. He used to practice it also. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, so the thing is that um, this kind of teaching, it also led to certain, you know, cults, cultic behaviors, you know, so everybody lives separately. They live in a commune. And then obviously there is someone who is giving the instructions, teaching, and that person is very controlling. right? And it's an open door for the enemy to come and spread whatever you know confusion in terms of heresies and so on. So yeah, so that's the danger of the thing. Um, yeah. Can people actually do it practically and biblically? I guess it is possible. <laughs> right? But the minute you say, okay, you need to you need to do this in order to be called a actual disciple of the Lord, you know, you know. Like for example, all the disciples themselves, you know, like where did Paul leave? Paul he lived in a rented house, it says, till the rest of his you know, it's not like he was with the thing he was ministering traveling and he lived in his own rented house till he was executed extra biblical you know uh, points to that so they didn't really apply it in their lives it was there for a time being but can i believe I, do you if you if you want to do it you can but you need to be careful you need to know that there are boundaries between the natural and the spiritual that uh, it comes with its own Dangerous. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because especially, you know, if you want to do that, you will you will have you'll have to put some rules, right? Okay. Uh, you'll have to put some this thing. Okay. Between this time and this time, the stove can be used. The refrigerator, you know, uh, you know, some. So you'll put some rules, and then will come in some kind of control, right? And then. If people are not following the thing, there has to be some kind of a punishment or disciplinary action. You see the outworking of that? So all that will happen. So it's, I don't know if it's... Mm, yeah. Yeah. Right. See, that's that's another thing, no? So that's a dangerous now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, very quickly, we'll just go into chapter thirteen and uh, look at a few things. See, these are things that we've already seen uh, in the earlier, but there could be an overlap. But look at some practical practical instructions. Okay. Um, first one is that God is watching over His word, perform it. So you preach the word of God, right? He is the one who is having that parallel conversation with the people to the listener. So he is convincing, he is reasoning with them, he knows where they are at the point of their need. But so we be faithful to deliver the word, right? So the the, the greatest assurance we have is that he will confirm the word in the lives of the hearers, right? We deliver the word. And of course, um, we will we may see immediate results in terms of life transformation. Like the person says, okay, today I came with so many addictions, I'm going back completely free. Or it could be a process where the person makes up their mind and say, okay, this is the first step I'm taking and it could be a process, right? We know that God's word is a seed. So uh, God's word will produce fruit if the seed is nurtured and it will bear fruit, right? The thing is, uh, other thing to keep in mind is, you know, See, in the course of us ministering the word, God 
you know each one of us is built differently okay some of us could be very serious some of us, some of us could be i don't know jovial you know that's our personality right but whatever be the personality god uses through us and it's still the word of god which comes through us right um do not use that time to merely entertain the people right to maybe make people laugh all the time or to make people feel good all the time let it not be a time of entertainment but a time of edification right so you know so the the thing is it's it's it doesn't mean that a hey, you know in the presence of god no laughing no moving you know everybody be you know it's god's presence no no it's not like that right in the presence of the lord there is fullness of joy right and there is freedom so there is freedom there is liberty but just make sure and the holy spirit will will let you know you know whether you are actually ministering so why do people minister to entertain you know why should they do that i think it comes from a place of insecurity it comes from a place of our identity not being secure right of wanting approval right people say wow that was fantastic i really enjoyed the message and uh, you know people saying pastor it was so good pastor uh, you know you want to hear that or you want that kind of a response from people so you know it's so uh, so that's the thing if you're if you're a person who's secure in who you are even if a person you know after the message nobody comes and tells you okay that was great or whatever you'll still be fine you know you knew that this is what god put in your heart to share and you share and you are faithful to do it and right? you just go on your way okay so yeah so our what is our responsibility to deliver the word of god in without adulterating it without changing it uh, without diluting it right and in the course of doing that rightly divide the word we looked at that our interpretation should be consistent with the rest of scripture we looked at that avoid arguments over words which brings disputes okay um uh, and then compare it's good to compare our okay this is what i believe but what does you know is there any any other teaching parallel to it you know to what i'm sharing it's good to compare you know it's good to see just to establish ourselves right um and uh, yeah every time we share we don't always have to have a new revelation minister the present to that's very important right minister the current truth meaning okay this is what happened in history right so so, so people actually stopped with that right um i believed and uh, it's a work of grace salvation work of grace through faith fine you share that but what is the present thing it is that and also the move of the holy spirit being filled with the holy spirit all that so minister the present current truth okay um yeah then avoid subjective revelation what is subjective revelation a revelation where you add a lot of your opinions and biases based on your experience okay so it's a subjective revelation like for example you know i was a working professional and i left okay so if it's a call to ministry and if i always say you need to leave your job in order to serve now that's a very subjective thing you know that's how god called me but i can't apply that in everyone's lives right okay um watch what you teach that's paul's instruction to timothy and develop the ability to communicate god's word clearly okay so we'll stop with that uh, next class we'll look at some practical ways okay, in terms of preparation this is just to uh, you know public speaking right we'll look at that okay um so uh, what we'll do is next class onwards we'll try and um uh take the i'll try and take the second hour also not today right so online students also just be prepared for you know um, for the next additional class as well like tuesday wednesdays uh, for the second hour okay thank you